Okay, so we're going to go through Revelation chapter 9. We're going to go over the fifth and sixth trumpets tonight. Things are really going to start escalating as we get toward the end. So first, we'll go through the fifth trumpet, and then we'll, we'll break that down. But before we get started, it's been a couple weeks since we've talked last. Let's review last week and kind of where we are in the timeline before we jump into the fifth trumpet. So last time we talked, we talked how God's holy ones, Christians, had been martyred. We talked about how Israel was the, was the reigning queen of Babylon in partnership with the Antichrist, but how the Antichrist turned on Israel and destroyed Israel, who was the prostitute. And then we talked about how the Antichrist, he set up his statue, which is called the Abomination of Desolation on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And that he is now the seventh reigning head of the beast, ruling the world from Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, on God's holy place. So he's ruling from that spot. And he's killed the Christians and he's destroyed Israel at this point. The 144,000 are still on earth. They are witnessing to the evil deeds of the Antichrist and his followers to be proclaimed on Judgment Day. God says there needs to be two or three witnesses. They are the third witness that is to stay and watch um, these things. God always needs a witness for it to be a just judge. So, you know, even at this point, your view of the rapture, I think even, you know, if last week, maybe you look at it differently, I, I would say that most people across the board would say that right now the church is gone whether they were raptured or if they were martyred by the Antichrist. So right now in the timeline, the church mm. is gone off the earth. The Antichrist has completely taken over Babylon. Pure evil at this point is reigning throughout the entire world. And it looks as though evil is winning over all humanity. And I just want to just let that set in for a minute that there's no, there's no, the church is gone. There's no Holy Spirit. There's no goodness in the world. Satan is reigning. He's the reigning king right now. And there's evil over the whole world. What a horrible thought of what that would be like. Satan has been given, and I put has been given because he doesn't have complete control. He has been given for a short time authority, and God has his thumb on this, that Satan has been given control of earth and its people. What a horrifying thought. They exclaim in Revelation 13, who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed, who is able to fight against him? So he's so powerful and he's got hold of the whole economy, the Babylon system. You can't buy or sell without his mark. You have to worship him or you die. He, he has got control of everything. And who, who is able to stand against him? And, and the question is unanswered. No one, no one on earth can fight against this. It is complete. Christine. Yes. So we are, this is the, uh, the second part of the tribulation, right? Right. right? Uh-huh. So here so, we are on the timeline. Here is the second half. And so okay. we're right here. So the witness, it's already dead. The two witnesses, the church are gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now what the about they're 144. They're still there. They're still here all the way to the seventh trumpet. They're here the whole time. But the, the church here, first half was being persecuted. Second half is gone. So okay. right now, this is where we are in the red. We're at the fifth trumpet. It's getting ready to start. And we're getting ready to go through this first terror right here. It actually should be like that, but I want like that, but I wanted you to read the fifth trumpet. So I extended it a little bit. 
So this is where we're about to talk about right here. Does that make sense where we are? Yeah. Okay. So right around here is where the Antichrist broke the treaty and he put up his statue of abomination and started to, he turned on the church here and here's where he turned on Israel. And now they're both gone and he's reigning. He has nothing standing in his way anymore. Nothing is in his way. Israel's not in his way. The church is not in his way. He's reigning king. He's that complete, well, not complete, because God is always in control, but he has um, been given authority for a short time. So, but now things begin, the tide begins to turn. Now we start to see how God begins to pay back the followers of the Antichrist for their evil deeds with these last three trumpets. He releases his hand of restraint and lets chaos absorb the earth. Does that make sense? So a lot of times, and Romans 1 talks about it, where it, it speaks of the wrath of God can be as simple as God removing his hand. And it le unleashes, it lets evil happen. And so that's what we're going to see here. Now that the church is gone, Israel is gone, and Satan is in control, God does pull his hand back, and we're going to see what happens. So this is a review as we go into the fifth trumpet. Just wanted to, to show here, we have the first four trumpets here in um, uh, we, we, we went over this before, but in verse 13, it says, then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. So it's said here, the first four have been blown, but the last three trumpets, the fifth, sixth, and the seventh, they call them the three terrors. And in some translations, it's woe, 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 the three woes. So whichever translation yours reads, um, but it, it is described as terrifying, the three terrors. And they truly are terrifying. I will prepare you that as we go through them, uh, I'm glad we're not here. I am glad we're not here to see this. And I feel for the 144,000 that even though they're protected, they have to see it. Um, but so I just wanted to re go uh, review that verse where it calls the next three, the three terrors. So terror, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. And so let's read the fifth trumpet and then we'll break it down. So it says the fifth trumpet brings the first terror is what my Bible, uh, the NLT, I think titles it as that. NIV also titles it as the first terror. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. When he opened it, smoke, po smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek Apollyon, the destroyer. So that's terrifying just reading that. But as we unpack it, it gets a little even scarier. Um, 
So first it says, the angel blew his fifth trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky. And it says there right here, it says, and he. So it's referencing the, the star as a he, first of all. So we know it's not necessarily a star, but we also know in Revelation in the, what we've read so far, stars are angels, but it says fallen. These are clues from what we've read so far. And remember that when the third trumpet blew, we talked about that the great star fell from the sky and how it fell on the, on the one third of the rivers and the water and the star was bitterness. And we talked about how that was Satan being kicked out of heaven. So the star, this is the star that's given a key to the bottomless pit. And the star is most likely Satan when he's being thrown out of heaven because he's been given authority for a short time. So the star that's falling from the sky is given a key. It's most likely the fallen angel, Satan, being kicked out of heaven. And he, so he's given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And locusts come out of this pit. So that's interesting wording. Now, these locusts were given power to sting like scorpions. They were given, and, and Satan was given the key to the shaft. Remember in Revelation 17, God's the one in complete authority. God is the one giving anyone power or giving anyone the ability to do anything. And remember Revelation 17, 17 told us that God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes and they will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast. So the words of God will be fulfilled. So we're seeing over and over here, God is letting his plan play out. He is the only one giving power to anybody, um, any authority. So he's given a key and the scorpion or the locusts are given power. Jeremiah talks a little bit about this reference. We talk about going to the old Testament. Okay. Where do we find talk about locusts? Is it really locusts or is it something else? What does the old Testament tell us? And there's a couple of verses, actually. So Jeremiah talks about it. Jeremiah 51 says, this is his vengeance against those who desecrated his temple. Now, remember what's going on right now. Satan has control of God's temple. He has put his own statue on it, and he's ruling the world from the temple in Jerusalem. It is being completely desecrated right now with unholiness. And so it starts out, this is his vengeance against those who desecrated his temple, raised the battle flag against Babylon, because Babylon, this is Babylon's headquarters at the temple, reinforce the guard and station the watchmen, prepare an ambush, for the Lord will fulfill all his plans against Babylon. You are a, a city by a great river, a great center of commerce, but your end has come. The thread of your life is cut. The Lord of heaven's armies has taken this vow and has sworn to it by its own name, by his own name. Your cities will be filled with enemies, like fields swarming with locusts, and they will shout in triumph over you. So in this, in this scripture, locusts are enemies, that in, his enemies are swarming like locusts. That's the description. And then Jeremiah goes on to say, raise a signal flag to the nations, sound the battle cry, mobilize them all against Babylon, prepare them to fight against her, bring out the armies of Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz, appoint a commander and bring a multitude of horses like swarming locusts. So here we see horses like swarming, the uh, multitude of horses are referred to as swarming locusts as a description. Bring against her the armies of the nations led by the kings of the Medes and all their captains and officers. The earth trembles and writhes in pain for everything the Lord has planned against Babylon stands unchanged. Babylon will be left desolate without a single inhabitant. So complete destruction. And Joel also says a short, short verse here. Wake up, you drunkards and weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers. All the grapes are ruined and all your sweet wine is gone. A vast army of locusts 
has invaded my land, a terrible army, too numerous to count. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, its fangs like those of a lioness. So again, we see how these locusts are like a terrible army and they're referred to as lions and, and with teeth and fangs. And Joel goes on to say, this is actually titled, Locusts Invade Like an Army. This says, sound the trumpet in Jerusalem, raise the alarm on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. Remember the day of the Lord is end times. It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness, suddenly like dawn spreading across the mountains and a great and mighty army appears, nothing like it has ever been seen before or will ever be seen again. So he's speaking of the end times. And so from these verses, we can see that locusts are references to enemy invading armies. So not necessarily the little bug, but it's an imagery of what the little bug and how they swarm, how they're when they swarm together as a large group, how destructive they are. So, so God is giving this army, this visual like a swarming locusts, but it's a invading enemy. And so they were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion sting. So only the wicked, only the wicked are being stung by these locusts. Anyone with the seal of God on their forehead is protected. And remember who has the seal of God on their forehead? It's the 144,000. The 144,000 were the ones that were in Revelation 7 were marked with the seal of God on their forehead. Here, we remember that we already kind of talked about it, but the 144 is protected during this time. And here's Revelation 7, where we talked about, wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we've placed the seal of God on the forehead of his servants. And it clearly says who these are. It says, I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. So it's specifically the tribes of Israel, the 144,000 who gets this seal on their forehead and they're protected from the fifth trumpet. So those invading armies cannot touch the 144,000, but anybody else is fair game. So they're invading, God has released his hand. He's letting this happen, but it's happening against the followers of the antichrist. Anybody who's left on the earth, anybody who has, um, you know, it's not the church, not Israel, anybody who's left over who accepted the mark of the beast. And the, dis whoops. And the description of the locust, you, you notice here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times it says the word like. So it's saying it's, it's like this. It's giving you an imagery. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is exactly what it looks like or what it is, but it's saying it's like horses prepared for battle, like bolt crowns on their heads. Their faces look like human faces, uh, hair like women's hair, like the teeth of a lion. Uh, and we're thinking, this sounds really weird. Um, wh who, what could this be? It, you know, if it's obviously if they have faces like human faces, they're not like the bug locust. Um, if they have hair like women's hair, this is definitely not like the bug. So what are these creatures? Well, we're going to peek ahead a little bit to the sixth trumpet um, just for a second, because there's a very similar situation happening in the sixth trumpet, but we'll get fully into the sixth trumpet later. But here, it talks about the four angels who've been prepared for this hour and day and month, and they're an army, and it says they wore armor, they have head like lions, fire and smoke burning sulfur from their mouths, and um, they had tails that had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. Very similar wording to, not exact, but very, very similar. They had heads like lions. So it's it's a, it's a similar talk. So 
if they're angels, these locusts that we're talking about here in the fifth trumpet, that these locusts that are coming out from this bottomless pit, it says he's, that Satan was given the key to the shaft of a bottomless pit to release these locusts. So if they're angels, then who are they and why are they locked in an abyss until this time? Well, a long time ago, it seems like we talked about this in way back in lesson one, seems like forever ago. But in lesson one, we talked about who our three major enemies were. And enemy number two was the seed of Satan. Enemy number one was Satan himself. Enemy number two was the seed of Satan. Uh, Genesis six, you remember the story of Noah, Noah and the ark. But right before Noah and the ark, it said, then the human beings began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them. And the sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilim lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with human women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes mentioned in legends of old. And in Job, it tells us the sons of God are angels. They're like, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So when it's referencing, and it also specifically says human women in some translations. So the angels came down, they had intercourse with human women and created this new race of this Nephilim which was blasphemous against God, and which is why he had to have the flood because the human race had been corrupted except for um, Noah and his line, the line from Seth. This is Cain's line that had been corrupted. And so first Peter, now we move to the New Testament. Peter talks about this. Peter refers back to Noah and he refers back to those angels and Peter in first Peter three in the new Testament, he says, and he's speaking of Jesus. He's speaking about when Jesus was three days in the ground, in the tomb. So he says, so he went and preached. He's saying, so Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. And he tells us who those spirits in prison were those who disobeyed God, disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. And then it talks about Noah, the eight people that were saved. But Peter specifically references Noah and the spirits in prison. And he says, that's who Jesus went to talk to when he was in, in the tomb for three days. He went to declare his victory to the spirits in prison. Peter also, he says again in second Peter, he says, well, he's talking about the end times. He says, many will follow the, their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah. So he taught, he goes back and he, he, Peter again references Noah and he references these angels that are being held in this abyss, this gloomy pit of darkness. And he's talking about these angels from the day of Noah. And that's, they're being held until now, until this fifth trumpet. This is when they're being held until this time. Jude also mentions, Jude says, this is also New Testament, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belong. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they were in the same way as these angels indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So here Jude specifically references how these angels went into sexual perversion against strange flesh against their own. 
And Genesis tells us it was that they came down and they had sexual relations with the human women and God threw them into the abyss until the end times. And so now we're seeing in the fifth trumpet that Satan gets a key and he is allowed to let them out. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing that I, that the star that had fallen, so he's already fallen and he's given a key and he's letting these other fallen angels out of the abyss to create havoc on the earth. And it says their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek Apollyon, the destroyer. We've seen this before in the Bible. The destroyer is mentioned a few times. Most specifically, in the Exodus, when he's going to have the death of the firstborn, and they're going to put the blood post all over their doorpost to protect them. It says, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. So the destroyer is under, of course, God's control. He can't do anything God doesn't allow. But even in the Exodus, God allowed the destroyer to go into the homes of the Egyptians and kill their firstborns. He, he removed his protection. Here it says they had tails that stung like scorpions. And for five months, they had the power to torment people. Job 15 talks a little bit about this. It says the wicked writhe in pain throughout their lives. Years of trouble are stored up for the ruthless. The sound of terror rings in their ears. And even on good days, they fear the attack of the destroyer. It, it's, it goes very, very, that verse goes very much with what's going on here. And they dare not go out into the darkness for fear they will be murdered. I can see why this is called the first terror. The thought of these fallen angels who deceived the Lord and went against him in the very beginning of time, millenniums ago, they've been held in this abyss for millenniums now being released upon the earth is truly terrifying. I could see why God would call it the first terror. So yeah, so, uh, so at this point in Revelation, now think about this. At this point in Revelation, remember we were talking about the first four trumpets, millions of angels. We said like what, 200 million eight fallen angels were being thrown out of heaven from heaven down to earth and they're furious. They were being kicked out of heaven. And now we see fallen angels coming up from down below out of the abyss where they've been locked away for thousands of years and they're furious. So you see this like this storm beginning, this evil storm of chaos beginning to happen. I think that's even my next slide is it's a truly a great storm of terror and chaos beginning upon the earth. Now, God is letting this happen because the only people left at this point, besides the protected, 144,000, are the people who took the mark of the beast, those who are following the Antichrist, those who, are, who, are, who will not repent and who are following, who are against God. So he lets this storm happen. And so then the bottom says, the first terror is past, but look, two more terrors are coming. So that was the first terror. And that's pretty terrifying. The thought of these fallen angels coming out who have been against God for millenniums and they've been locked in the abyss. I would not want to be around for sure. It sounds horrible. Now the sixth trumpet brings the second terror. And this was actually, um, it, it gets pretty much absolute chaos. It is the storm of all storms, basically. We already talked about these angels coming down, these angels coming up and the storm, but the sixth trumpet also brings the second terror, which it really gets crazy on earth. The sixth trumpet brings the second terror. It brings the seven bowls of God's wrath, it leads us into the day of the Lord, and it brings Armageddon. So the sixth trumpet leads us into some pretty terrifying stuff. I can see again why God would call this the second terror. Um, so now we're moving over 
from the fifth to the sixth. This is where we are now. We're going into this, the second terror, sixth trumpet. This is God's wrath being poured out on Babylon. So that's what we're getting ready to see here. So when you read, when you first read the sixth trumpet, um, well, we'll just read through it and we'll, we'll go. It, it was truly kind of chaotic. So it's hard. It was kind of hard at first to bring it together where we could see it clearly because it just, it, it, there's a lot going on, but we'll start. Let's read through the sixth trumpet and we'll, we'll keep going. So the sixth trumpet brings the second terror. And, and this heading is in my Bible. I don't know about you guys. It even says that. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision, I saw the horses and the riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The horses had heads like lions and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. One third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues, by the fire and smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes and the power to injure people. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that can ne neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So first it says, he, he blow, the angel blows his trumpet. It says, release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. And well, wait a minute, first, yeah, the four angels. And we hear about this, he, these four angels are at the four corners of the earth. And we've, we've seen this, imagery before when Daniel starts talking his visions in the very beginning he sees that the four winds of heaven are already stirring before he starts telling us about everything that's rising up that he says the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and in revelation 7 right before they they mark the 144,000 the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds we see this, they're holding back this chaos that's about to happen. And he's like, wait, before you unleash the chaos, chaos, let's seal my people. And before we go into all this, Daniel references it and Revelation references it. And the 144,000 is protected during both the fifth and the sixth trumpets. They're both, they're protected during both. Um, the four angels are now being released to cause great harm on the earth. They cause this chaotic storm of evil to get even bigger. Um, but I wanted to stop for a minute. And before we go, keep going about this chaotic storm that's happening on the earth of evil. Remember the story of Jesus in the storm? It's just a short little story in your Bible. It really is just a little paragraph long. It's this long. It's, it's just a couple of verses. It says, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap, but soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, master, master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. Then he asked them, where's your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and waves obey him. I believe this story is included. It's a short story. It's not that long, but it is included in the gospels to be remembered in the end times. 
that Jesus will return. And when he does, this story reminds us that Jesus has the power and authority to calm any storm, even this one, this evil, chaotic, spiritual storm that's happening on the planet, all over the earth. And it's, it's who can fight against it? Who can stand? Jesus is going to come back and he can control even a storm of this magnitude. So I do believe that story is included because of the storm of revelation in the end times that remember Jesus will calm the storm. So it talks about the great Euphrates River. And there is some significance to the Euphrates River. Um, the area of the Euphrates River has been the scene of much conflict in centuries past. Uh, the Euphrates, which we first hear about it in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 2.14, it was regarded not only as the eastern boundary of the promised land given to the patriarchs, um, but also marked the site of ancient Babylon. So this site here, the Euphrates River, has links to the Garden of Eden, has links to the promised land, and has links to Babylon, all in one. Um, there's so much history with the Euphrates River. It's also a source of great conflict. And the four angels who had been prepared for this hour, day, month, and year were turned loose to kill one third and they're an army of 200 million mounted troops. So they are an army and they're headed to war. But what war? What war against who? What's going on? What is going on with this, this million, 200 million mounted troops? Where are they headed? So we saw in Revelation 17, so God executed his judgment against Israel for her adultery with the Antichrist. So he punished her. He let the kingdom of the beast destroy Israel. And here's the verses where it talks about that, where um, the scarlet beast has 10 horns, all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will all agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast. So the words of God will be fulfilled. So we see in this that God punished Israel, but now he punishes those who were the tools that punished Israel. Does that make sense? So he, he, he let them punish Israel because she needed to be punished for her adultery. But now we see where God punishes the Antichrist and all the nations who joined the Antichrist kingdom in destroying Israel. So now he's going to punish them, which is everyone else on earth. He's going to punish all of them. I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. This is Jeremiah's prayer. Jeremiah is seeing this. And so Jeremiah prays, I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. We are not able to plan our own course. So correct me, Lord, but please be gentle. Do not correct me in anger, for I would die. Pour out your wrath on the nations that refuse to acknowledge you, on the peoples that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured your people, Israel. They have devoured and consumed them, making the land a desolate wilderness. So it's talking about referencing, they killed Israel. They deserve punishment. And Isaiah says, woe to you, destroyer. Remember, destroyer is Satan, the king of these angels. While you are not destroyed, and he who is treacherous, while others did not deal treacherous with treacherously with him as soon as you finish destroying you will be destroyed as soon as you cease to deal treacherously others will deal tre treacherously with you so what this is saying is once you once you pour out your evil god's going to pour out his wrath on satan he's going to deal with him and so we begin to see this happen now god this is where god begins to pour out his wrath He's been removing his hand, letting things happen on the followers, uh, the wicked on the earth. But now he's really going to pour out the wrath. This is the day of wrath where he pours out the bowls. 
Romans 12 says, never take your own vengeance, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. And here it is. This is the day of wrath. So that's what this is referencing. This is the wrath of God getting ready to be poured out. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So Revelation 14 tells us more about the wrath of God. Um, then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So it's very specific. Those who worship the beast in his image and who receives the mark in his name are going to get the they're going to drink the wine of the wrath of God mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And in Revelation 18 tells us that these plagues, this wrath of God, the bowls of wrath, these plagues overtake her in a single day. So death and mourning and famine, she'll be completely consumed by fire for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. So remember where we're in this wrath of God here, this, this, uh, I guess the other one was a better, this one, this wrath, that's a better um, image. So what we see here, well, actually this one is what we see here is the seven bowls of wrath being, they're going to be poured out and it leads up. You'll see where it connects to the army. So it was, he starts pouring out the bowls of wrath and then it connects up with what this army is doing. So let's start seeing. So as the sixth, sixth trumpet blows, he starts pouring out the plagues, the bowls of wrath. They're poured out in the, the day and hour. This is what the day of wrath that, that the whole Bible speaks about. The bowls of wrath in Revelation 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And so the pouring out of the bowls of God's wrath on Babylon is the final showdown between God and Satan over the control of his people. We see the ultimate fulfillment of the beginning showdown between Moses and Pharaoh from the exodus in Egypt. Pharaoh had God's people enslaved and would not let them go. The events of the Exodus were a foreshadow to the final events in Revelation. It's the same thing. We're going to see the same showdown happen that was in Exodus in Revelation. The 144,000 remnant of Israel are still on the earth. They cannot be harmed or killed. So they're being enslaved around the world. God pours out the plagues, bowls of wrath and vengeance for the, their vengeance for the martyrs, but also as a warning to let my people go, just like in the Exodus. And so the, as the plagues are released, the bowls of wrath, we see that Satan and his followers, the Antichrist and his followers do not repent. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and a harmful and painful sore afflicted the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped his name. So it only affected those with the mark. Exodus nine, the, it's like the sixth plague of Exodus. A terrible affliction is like the sixth plague God sent to Egypt before the Exodus, the plague of boils. So we see a similarity there. Zechariah tells us more what these end time boils look like. Zechariah 14 says these end time boils. It says, now this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples who've gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue will rot in their mouth. So these boils are pretty bad. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like blood, like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. And that's a lot like the second trumpet. The second trumpet was a, life, uh, a lot like that. 
And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, he praises God. He's like, righteous are you, the one who is and who was a holy one, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. So he's saying, your wrath is just. He's crying out, yes, Lord. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And he references that they killed, they killed the, the martyrs, the, the Christians. And so the third bowl is, sounds like the first plague God sent to Egypt before the Exodus, where he turned the river to blood. It's also like the third trumpet where it turned, uh, it made the rivers and streams bitter. The, bowl, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given power to scorch people with fire. And the people were scorched with fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. So there's no repentance going on. One thing I wanted to point out, you notice right here, righteous are you, the one who is and who was, O holy one. You notice how throughout the whole revelation, it kept singing, O oh, glory, glory to the one who is and who was and who is to come. Here, who is to come is omitted because he's, he's right at the doorstep. He's, he's here. He's, 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 all, he's almost coming. We're right at the seventh trumpet almost. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores. And again, they did not repent of their deeds. So the fifth bowl is like the ninth plague God sent to Egypt before the Exodus, the darkness for three days. And I made a little chart here to just to compare the Exodus plagues to the the bowls being poured out. And so they're not exact, but there's very, very similar um, plagues going on. So if you have the um, PowerPoint later, you can uh, reference this. But also notice how the bowls also sound like the trumpets. The first trumpet, the earth burned up. And the first bowl was the, uh, poured out on the earth painful sores, the second one, the, uh, a third. So in the, in the trumpets, it keeps saying a third, a third, a third, a third the sea came blood. But on the bowls, it doesn't say, it just says, he poured his bowl in the sea and it becomes blood. And the trumpet, a third of the rivers and springs bitter. On the bowl, it just says the rivers and springs become blood. And then a fourth, a third darkness. And, um, and it says sun scorch with thirsty. But I was thinking, this verse right here, Revelation 18, which we'll, we'll get is talking about the fall of Babylon. So it's kind of like we're looking back. But he says, do to her as she has done to others, double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others. So brew twice as much for her. And that scripture really stood out to me because it kept saying one third, one third, one third. And here you have, he's saying double her penalty, pour out two times as much. And so it, it put this fraction in my head. We have one third, he pours out double and that's complete. Like it equals one. It's like you, you have the beginning where the antichrist is, is persecuting the Christians and he's pouring out his terror. But God pours out double on the Antichrist and his kingdom, and it's complete, if that makes sense. And, okay, and so then the sixth angel, so we're at the sixth bowl. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and listen to this. And its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. So what we are saying is scripture says that the bowls are poured out in one day and it wraps up right here with 
the Euphrates, which was being talked about in the sixth trumpet. I mean, the, the, yeah, the sixth trumpet that this army is gathering together. Well, here it says the water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east to pass. So they're going to pass through this Euphrates River for this war. And the very next verse is Armageddon. So you have the sixth bowl of wrath. The water is cleared up of the Euphrates so that they're mounting this army in the sixth trumpet. And when the sixth bowl is poured out, you see Armageddon is beginning. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the entire world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the almighty. So they know God's coming and they're preparing to fight against him. This is where Jesus says, behold, I am coming like a thief. We see this scripture. When you see this, when I'm coming like a thief, he says it right here. Like he, Jesus says it before, but here he says it again. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. He's talking about the seventh trumpet. I'm coming. I'm almost here and I'm coming quickly. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and people will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place, which in Hebrew is called Har-Mageddon. A little bit about Armageddon. The word Armageddon is made up of two Hebrew words of Har and Megiddon. It means mountain and Megiddo. Megiddo was the ancient city on the Jezreel plain that guarded a pass through the central highlands to the Esdraelon plain. And this area is known for historic warfare. It's, it's known for all kinds of battles in biblical history, in Jewish history, um, just a, a large battle site. And there, uh, some of the famous people in the Bible were killed there in the book of first, second Kings. Can't remember off the top of my head, but, but yeah, so Megiddo is a place this plain, this battlefield um, in Israel. And Isaiah speaks of this day of the Euphrates River. And look at this. This was amazing. This blew me away. Isaiah says, you got to remember, Isaiah lived way after the Exodus. The Lord will make a dry path through the Gulf of the Red Sea. He will wave his hand over the Euphrates River sending a mighty wind to divide it into seven streams so it can easily be crossed on foot. That matches what we're talking about. That matches the sixth bowl and the sixth trumpet where it talks about this Euphrates River that this army is going to cross it. And it, it goes on to say, he will make a highway for the remnant of his people. The remnant, so the remnant's the 144,000. The remnant coming from Assyria, just as he did for Israel long ago when they returned from Egypt. He's saying it. Israel is going to cross the Red Sea again with it parted. God is going to wave his hand and divide it up. And, and, and Israel is with well, the 144,000, the remnant is going to pass through it again, just like in the Exodus. So something amazing is going on here with the 144,000 and this war brewing. Notice here it talks about all three, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And these unclean spirits like frogs come out of their mouth. And it says they are spirits of demons. And these demons, they go out into the world and they're performing signs. And they're trying to convince all the people, look at our power. Look how much power we have. Join, a, you know, join us in this war. And just like uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, I'm sure, very similar where the the prophets of Baal of, of Jezebel were trying to show their power. But what John is seeing here with Armageddon, John is seeing the gathering of the world leaders driven by demons from the false prophet and the Antichrist and Satan to join together against Almighty God in prideful arrogance. They're preparing for battle against Jesus. 
And it says, gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the almighty. They are preparing for war with God. Yeah, that's where he warns. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. So when you look at the other times Jesus mentions, behold, I'm coming like a thief. You got to look at this one. I think a lot of the other version of all the other scriptures where I'm coming like a thief. I think that they are. They're not put in context properly as of what day that's talking about. And he's talking about right here, I'm coming like a thief, like the seventh trumpet, Armageddon. He's coming quickly. And so back to the sixth trumpet, where it's talking about this army that's mobilizing. It says, but the people who did not die in the plagues, those plagues being poured out by the bowls, still refuse to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continue to worship demons and idols made of gold, bronze, silver, and stone. So we see that at this point, there's no repentance. They're just blaspheming God. At this point, like I said, the two witnesses, the church is gone. And whoever is on the earth left just blasphemes the Lord in, in everything that happens. At this point, the sixth bowl has been poured out. The, the Euphrates River is drying up. The army is mobilized. Armageddon is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. We're at the very moment. I mean, the, right at the threshold of Jesus returning now. Ezekiel 30 says, son of man, prophecy and say, this is what the Lord God says, wail, woe for the day, for the day is near. Indeed, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations, because they're going to war with Jesus. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Indeed, it is near a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So we're right here, right on the threshold of Jesus' return. They're mobilized. They're ready to fight. Armageddon's coming. And so next week, we're going to go over the seventh trumpet. And what we will see at the seventh trumpet, we're going to see the Lord do the resurrection and he's going to rapture the 144,000 uh, and he's going to, he does this. He resurrects and raptures us off the earth so that Armageddon can begin. The battle of Armageddon can begin. He gets us all to him first because we're off the earth. So the battle can start. We're, we're not going to be on the earth. Not even our dead bodies are not even going to be, he's taking us off the earth so that the battle of Armageddon can begin. And what we see, so you've got Babylon, right? We talked about how Satan is ruling the world. And you remember what we're going to talk, we're going to talk about this next week, but I want to kind of give a glimpse that remember when Jesus went in and he flipped the money changers in his father's temple, that was pointing to this day. He, Jesus returns and he flips the worldwide economy of Babylon, whose headquarters is sitting on his father's temple. So that was a prophecy to this, that he's angry and he's going to come in and he's going to flip this wealthy economy on its head. How dare you set up shop on my, in my father's house? And so we're going to see him crumble this money-changing market. Then in the war, we see that Jesus, he's pulled us all off. He completely destroys all the inhabitants on the earth, everyone. And there's a lot of verses that talk about this, but there's one that is the best. And it's, it's, a, it's a full scripture. I just want to read through it because it gives us such a clear idea of what's happening. But there's a lot of others. But let's, let's look at this one because I don't want to you know, go too long. It's the day of the Lord. It's Zephaniah chapter one. And I'm just going to read through it because he talks about this day and what Jesus is going to do. Listen to this. It's pretty amazing. He says, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. 
To do that, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth. I will remove human and animal life. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. I will reduce the wicked to heaps of rubble, and I will wipe humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will crush Judah and Jerusalem with my fist and destroy every last trace of their Baal worship. I will put an end to all the idol idolatrous priests, because remember, they're, they're in the temple. They're in the temple doing Baal worship. He says, I will put an end to all the idolatrous priests so that even the memory of them will disappear. For they will go up to their roofs and bow down to the, for they go up to their roofs and they bow down to the sun, moon, and stars. They claim to follow the Lord, but then they worship Molech too. And I will destroy those who used to worship me, but now no longer do. They no longer ask for the Lord's guidance or seek my blessing. Be silent before the Lord God, for the awesome day of the Lord's judgment is near. The Lord has prepared his people for a great slaughter and has chosen their executioners. On that day of judgment, says the Lord, I will punish the leaders and princes of Judah and all those following pagan customs. Yes, I will punish those who participate in pagan temple worship ceremonies, who fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. And on that day, declares the Lord, there will be a cry of alarm from the fish gate. The fish gate is Jerusalem's marketplace. You notice here how it starts to talk a lot about the marketplace because he's gonna like he's gonna flip the tables in the marketplace. Wailing from the second quarter and a loud crash from the hills. Wail and sorrow, all you who live in the market area of Jerusalem, for all the merchants and traders will be destroyed. All who weigh out silver will be eliminated. I will search with lanterns in Jerusalem's darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent in their sins. They think the Lord will do nothing to them, either good or bad. That terrible day of the Lord is near, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. It will be a day when the Lord's anger is poured out, a day of, a day of terrible distress and anguish, a day of ruin and desolation a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet calls and battle cries. Down go the walled cities and the strongest battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they will walk like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's anger. And all the earth will be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a horrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. So that's hard to read. Even if, you know, the world is, when we're talking about the end. But I want you to remember this. Remember we talked about at the beginning of this lesson, the very beginning, we talked about how the earth was crying out, who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed, who is able to fight against him? And remember, it, there was no answer because the answer was no one. No one is able to fight against the beast. He will reign indefinitely because no one can fight against the beast, the, the Babylon system. But now, now they're crying out, we will see next week. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried out, they cried to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to survive? Do you see the difference? Who is able to fight against the beast and beast? And now it's, it's Jesus Christ. He's the only one in all the universe who is going to be able to come back and crush this, this tower of Babel, this Babylon system, this, this fight against this beast in this 
army, in this Armageddon, we're going to see. And Jesus will win. And so now they've switched their tune for the great day of the wrath has come. And who is able to survive? And God says, no one. So we, we saw what the fifth trumpet was. And the sixth trumpet was the bowls being poured out leading up to Armageddon, leading up to this, this army and this preparing of basically the, the end the end. I mean, we will be resurrected off the earth, but in this Armageddon next week, we'll see the resurrection. We'll see the war of Armageddon. We're going to see the, set of the Lord's return, the seventh trumpet and the Lord Jesus arrive in Armageddon though. He, every, he destroy, he wins. He destroys the entire antichrist kingdom and all of its followers. And uh, it's, it's rough, but it is just, right? It is, God's wrath is, like the angel cried out earlier, the angels cheering him on, your wrath is righteous. So yes, yeah, so next week, we'll go over all of that. We'll, we'll finish Armageddon. We'll talk about the seventh trumpet. We'll talk about what happens to the 144,000, which is absolutely beautiful and amazing. And then we'll talk about what happens after that. I have a question in a sense, like we always learned that. Um, so you're talking about the teeth, right? When Jesus come back, um, everybody says there is, I mean, we don't know the day of the hour, right? Right. But it's look like, I don't know about those people, but it's look like when you see all that happening, you're going to be able to know a little bit how close we are, right? And I think Jesus kind of mentions that. Remember, he does say when you see the fig trees, uh, you know, the time is getting close. You remember that scripture? Yeah. I think what he's saying is you don't know the day or the hour, but you can definitely tell when things start happening um, that you're getting closer for sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but yes, even though they're preparing, uh, it, I don't think that they know the day or the hour. And of course the church we're we're not, we don't know the day or the hour that all of this is going to begin either. We watch for the signs, right? So we look for the signs that the tribulation will begin, but we don't know when we can't set a date. We can't say 2060, you know, we don't, we don't know. Um, I think it's kind of the same here. Like they see the signs, they, they see the bowls being poured out, the plagues being poured out. So um, it seems that they know that it's close. But it's look like the people that's going to stay here, they're really not going to know anything about that. And right. the people that know is not going to be here. <laughs> right, it's right. Interesting, like, uh, another thing is I was just thinking like, when the Bible is talking about the, the passage that talks about whatever is true, one will be taken, one will be left, or the two people in the bed, one you can. When when I look at that that part, I don't know. I have to read it again, but it sounds like everything is in peace when that's happening. But and then when you see the rapture happening on the ends, it looks like there's a lot of cows and 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 war and all this kind of craziness. I don't, I can't picture anybody in the fields. I don't know. I might have this wrong idea of the, this passage. Well, Maybe I need to. So I guess, let me, I guess, so there still is the Babylon system, which is super wealthy and that's still going on on the earth. There is destruction. Like they're able to sting the fifth trumpet. They're able to sting people for five months, but they don't die. And after five months, it's over. Um, and then in the, uh, sixth trumpet, the bowls are being poured out, but the, we see that when Jesus comes back and, and tears down Babylon, we'll see that next week. Cause we're going to read revelation 18, that the Babylon system is still fully thriving. It's Great. super rich. Like it's, it's a worldwide economy that is still going, even with these bowls being poured out, even with the, the being 
stung for five months. Kind uh, of like the pharaoh, right? He was still rich, but still have a good life when all the plagues was going on. Right, right. right. And what I think, the 144,000, I, I think of like uh, Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they were trying to kill them, but they couldn't. Like the lion wouldn't eat Daniel. They couldn't burn Shadrach, you know, in the fire. I think the 144,000 are protected. And so they are there since it's like the let my people go. It's like they're being enslaved. So I think they're being sent out and probably working in the fields or, you know, doing work, slave work. And so when you see two are in the field, one is taken, it looks like slave work. Um, you know, and, and so the 144,000 are still there and they're the ones that are being taken, but the Babylon system is still thriving because that's what Jesus comes to knock down. He, he, like the flipping of the money changers, right. And it talks about in revelation 18, which we haven't got to yet. We'll get to that next week. It talks about this Babylon, how they're this super wealthy merchants and they own everything. And so I guess with the bowls being, they're getting cursed and getting these plagues pour, pour out, just like in Egypt, you know, they, they had the plagues poured out on them, but they, life kept going. Um, you see what I'm saying? Like they, yeah. and I'm not professing that I, I understand exactly everything what's happened here. You know, like there's a lot going on and there, I still have so much to learn myself but I do see somewhat of how things are pointing to each other, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions. You know, I'm not exactly sure how some of these things are exactly going to play out um, because it, it, is, it is hard to put together, but yeah. I can't see how a lot of it is pointing to each other. Yeah, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but does it see uh, how the the um, the sixth trumpet and how the bowls are kind of tied together, like the plagues being poured out and the very last bowl is like the introduction to Armageddon? Is yeah. that that's kind of interesting. So, yeah, I have a question on that, Christy. Mm hmm. Um, so the seventh bowl is the earthquake, right? And um, will be the, the sign of Jesus' return. Right. And also the sixth seal is the earthquake. So it's not the same earthquake? It is the same. So if you notice right here on the screen, the seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl and the sixth seal, oh. all the same thing. The sixth seal was declaring the sixth trumpet and the seventh bowl is poured out with the seventh trumpet. It all happens at once. And then it's like, it is finished. I see. Yeah, it's, it, it is, was confusing for, and that was one of the things that right there that made me realize one day how this was not in order because the sixth seal and the seventh trumpet were the same. And I'm like, how could that happen twice? Because it's pretty final. <laughs> you know, and so the sixth, um, the si seventh trumpet, seventh bowl, and the sixth seal are all the same. And the third terror is Jesus's return. It's, uh, it's that's the terror is here I am the day. And what, come. and what about like the trumpets? Like, uh, for example, the second trumpet is the meteor uh, that turns the sea into blood. Is that the same one as the third bowl? So uh, they reference each other, but I know in the first three trumpets, it seems to be referencing these fallen angels being kicked out of heaven. But what it looks like in the bowls is that God pours out like a double portion of wrath. So when these angels get kicked out of heaven, they come down to earth. You know, I don't, well, they're at that time, the Christians are being persecuted you know, maybe there's something going on there that, that he's pouring out wrath, double the cup of what you're coming down in wrath and doing to my people. 
you know, I see the word references there, but I am not exactly sure how they play out, uh, you know, how they're, how they're exactly alike. Do you know what I mean? It is, it is interesting, the wording um, that he uses, but it, it is. Yes. Kind of like Exactly. And that's why it's so confusing. You try to organize in your mind all these things and it, it goes back and forth and some repetition and you're trying to understand what it is. Yeah. Yeah, but it seems you to me that, that the second trumpet, I'm sorry, the second trumpet is Satan, right? The third, the third um, trumpet. The third, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, the th that one is the the third one is the the great star that gets kicked out, like the old you know the head the head honcho, he, and he's filled with bitterness. Right, that's the third trumpet. You know, we see some similarities here, but we also know during this time, the first as they're getting kicked out of heaven, Christians are getting heavily. You know, the two witnesses are getting heavily persecuted. You know, it could be referencing they're getting kicked out of heaven and they're coming down to earth in a rage and they're going after God's people is what it says. And it says it, that it's allowed one third. Well, over here, when he pours out the bowls, he's like, I'm pouring you out a double cup of what you did to my people. That's kind of what I see going on with those two scenarios. Are you trying to think what all is going on at the same time? You're like, oh, okay, they're getting thrown out, but God's people are getting martyred at the same time. But it says one third, you know what I'm saying? So when you yes. start those together, you're like, oh, okay, now he's going to pour out a double cup of vengeance because you have the blood of the saints on your hands. You, you know what I mean? So yes, yeah, it's right here. It's, yeah, double the penalty. But yeah, it, it takes a long time to, you know, to put all these things together. It's, it's, uh, but it is amazing when you start to see it unfold, God's plan, it blows me away. Like, wow, like that is intense and it's genius and it's just, and it's amazing. And there's so much going on on the spiritual side of things that, I still don't quite understand, you know, I, I don't fully understand what's going on on the angel side of things because that that's hard to see for us. We really only have what the Bible says and it, it's hard to picture. So what's going yeah. on with, you know, the angels. And it really, yeah. And it really blows my mind that people after all that is you did not repent. I know, you know, like, okay, nowadays, you don't see so much of the supernatural, but at that time for you to not repent, it's right. just, right, shocking. they're gonna, they're gonna have a word at that time, the mark of the beast, right? Yeah, once, once they have the mark of the beast, they're sealed with evil. I don't think there's yeah. a way that they can repent of anything because they conscious because they're convicted. They're yeah, convicted they already, of what they're following. Yeah, they already seal and make a pact. It's, yes. it's like make a pact with evil. I mean, there's nothing can broke this pact anymore. I think you're exactly right. When you think about the Exodus, in the first, I think in the first five plagues, it says that uh, that God heart uh, was it God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In the last five plagues, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Do you know, so it's it's like they have the mark of the beast. It's like their hearts are hardened at that point, so hardened that there's no repentance. Yeah, yeah, it, it is crazy to think though. It's like when you start seeing the signs, how they would not repent, but I guess their hearts have been truly hardened against the Lord. Yeah. One of the things that I think the Lord, uh, the Lord really allows all this evil is to show people that how evil looks like. Because mm -hmm. if, I mean, I think those angels when they were in heaven, they didn't know what evil looks like. That's why third part of them follow 
uh, Lucifer because they thought they really thought that it could be better than gods and and really be powerful and even win when they realized that they can't i think was set aside as an example for all the other angels right right now you can see what's good and what's evil and then i think all this evil going on in the earth that the lord allows is to show human like which side you want to pick? You want to pick this destruction here? You want to follow these guys here? You want to follow me, the true God that has love and, and, and compassion? Because this is what you're going to become if you have pride. You know, right. this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, that's your destiny if you have pride. And this is going to set as an example for the whole eternity. Because right. people in eternity are going to remember and, and know what evil is look like, right? Exactly. They're going to know that, you know, they're always going to choose God because now they know what is the life without God. And, right. and they're going to always, you know, uh, adore him and, and worship him because now they know what evil look like. And that's an excellent point because remember in the very beginning, Eve took the bite of the apple of the knowledge of good and evil. And by this point, we are like, okay, we know the difference between good and evil. Now we know, right? We see evil reigning. We know the difference between good and evil. Yeah. And, it's and horrible. And, and, and it's so horrible. It's these people that know what evil is that they choose evil. I, I cannot understand those Satanist people that are involved with all this evil doing and they choose evil. I have seen many people like that, you know, worshiping devil and, and, and doing all kinds of witchcrafts. I mean, how can you choose evil? Because there's those people that are, they are blind, they are they're deceived. There's many people deceived. They are going toward to false religions and and they have this, you know, idea that what they believe is good, and and they're totally deceived. But there's those people that they they know exactly what they're doing, yeah. and and they well, choose. Well, the thing people. is also the evil. It's not nowadays. Uh, it, it it makes it look good, like you know, it's uh, false religions and new new age. The, you know, the new age religion. It's all it's masquerade you know people thinking that they are following something good when it the truth is it's something that it's to totally ungodly so it will be hard for us as christians to go against what the world are, uh, is claiming as something that is a good thing you know what i'm saying right mm -hmm. and it's all in the name of love and it's all in the name of um, respect when it's totally going against God. Right. Yeah. So sometimes evil is not, it doesn't look evil from the outside. Right. Yeah, but there is the evil that when to show his face, I'm telling like, there's those people that they know who evil is and they still choose him. Yeah. Just right. like, there's they, both. There's the ones who like yeah, know there's the ones that just see, but the ones, <laughs> but there is the ones that really choose evil. They know who is evil, and they choose him. Like they, they, yeah, they there are many singers up there that they did a pact with Satan to become popular, famous, <laughs> and have money. So they know who they are choosing, and 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 now there is like the Satanist church, and they're very open, and they know what they're doing, but. You know, it's just like, whoa, like, how can you really choose that knowing who he is? Right. And it's crazy. They would be so blatantly acceptant of evil. You can almost understand what Sarah was saying when it when it's a little more sneaky. Yes. It, and that's know, the illusion those days. They all deceive, you know. Yeah. But I see. I see. What was you that Marcia? Was that Marcia? Huh? Which was Matza that was here before? I saw someone, but the, the name was Serena. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell who it was. Yeah, it said Serena, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Wait. I don't understand how you just 
blatantly accept evil, I, I can, I can't understand that either. Um, but it's well, sad. There seems to be a lot more of it these days. It seems to be being popular. Witchcraft seems to be being more popular to me. That's oh, kind yeah. of weird. yeah. And 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 they they totally know what they're doing. I mean, they are doing horrible. So Satanist people, I have seen some testimony of Satanists that used to be Satanists and ended up accepting Jesus and um, turning themselves to Christ. And they tell things that was just like unbelievable. Mm. Like there is no way that you don't know that that was evil. <laughs> you know, that's pure evil and they know that's evil, but they choose to do that is just like horrible yeah yeah and, but i think you're right i think that we will truly know the knowledge of good and evil when all of this is over and i think that god lets this evil happen because on judgment day he will be able to be a just judge because they the evil happened and you and he has witnesses and that he will be able to throw all of these beings into hell and it will be just because they were evil but it's terrifying to think that all these things we've talked about in revelation all from the beginning you know martyrs and you know evil reigning and all that all of this would happen but but we would think okay well like you said it it's for eternity for eternity we will remember and hopefully learn and understand that god is good and that we would always choose god over exactly evil. All right. Well, I guess um, since it's getting late, we, I, let's, I guess we should pray and then we'll, we'll go on for our evening. Um, anybody want to pray? Wrap up or? Anybody want to pray, ladies? You feel like praying? It's okay. I'll pray for us. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing all of us ladies together that you thank you for putting your spirit into us and giving us a one mind and making us family um we love getting together and learning more about you and your plans for us and how much you love us and what you're doing for us and just how awesome you are um thank you again for these sisters who you've said that they're my family i thank you so much for for each one of us and bringing us together for the series and for all the other blessings in the future. Um, be with each one of us this week as we go to our families with Thanksgiving. Help if anybody's traveling, help us to be safe um, and help your words sit on our hearts, Lord. Help us to think about you and remember your words and live out our lives like your son, Jesus. Thank you so much. In Jesus name. Amen.